often we're the most burned out. And I'll talk about why in a second. And they, they, they start out with a clear sense of calling, but they have lost it. Uh, you know, a new survey just came out this week. I saw it on Fox News, so I printed it off. And uh, according to Barna Research, 42% of pastors they surveyed have considered quitting full-time ministry within the past year. That's up 13% from the previous year. The reasons that they mentioned were, number one, because of stress, loneliness, political divisions, you know, like during the, during the pandemic. Some, some, uh, some church members wouldn't come back to church because others were not wearing masks. Others would not come back to church because other people were wearing masks. You know, all these divisions. And, uh, and then the, also the toll of ministry upon their families. What about the average church course? From our own experience, about 80% of Christians don't know their calling, so therefore they're confused. All right, yeah, here is the original vision again, those three levels of retreats, which I just mentioned earlier. Uh, revitalization, refocus, and renewal. Okay, three different kinds of burnout. First of all, spiritual fatigue or emotional fatigue. And this one might seem kind of unlikely, especially for a pastor. Now, you can probably, if you're not a pastor, relate to some of these. Uh, that's just basically the law of supply and demand. If you're giving out more than you're taking in. Uh, and the pastor, you know, is, is uh, a likely candidate because they're often giving out more than they take in. Giving and giving, doing counseling and preaching and meetings. And so eventually this catch up, catches up with them and their spiritual life is depleted. 70% uh, of pastors, I found in another, another study, said that they had a lower self-esteem when than now than when they started ministry. 70% said they fought, they fight depression on a routine basis. 85% have never taken a sabbatical, typically of a, a month or longer. And the root of this is what you could call compassion fatigue. Uh, one researcher, Freudenberger, uh, introduced this term about 40 years ago. He discovered that in the helping professions, you know, like a, a nurse or a social worker or a pastor, they're susceptible to this. A negative state of mind can develop because they're always showing compassion to others, but what about for their own soul? And so this is character, characterized by exhaustion, uh, a sense of reduced uh, effectiveness, and decreased motivation. We see this all the time with pastors that come to our oasis. They are expended emotionally and spiritually. And so we spend a whole week trying to help them restore their spiritual energies, refocus on God, loving God. That, they're, that you know, their, their primary calling is to know Him and to love Him with their heart, soul, mind, and strength, not to do ministry. And uh, recently we had a couple come, a missionary couple come from Central America. They're, they were so tired. Their spiritual energy was so depleted that it was hard for them just to trust God again. They were ready to, to step out of ministry. They were able to spend a lot of time in solitude and begin to turn their corner, especially as we help them write their purpose statement, to see that their, their vertical call to know God was so much more important than their horizontal call of their ministry. Secondly, vocational stress. And you may experience this if you're a pastor or if you're not. This is basically a poor fit in with the ministry or with a job. Where you're just in the, not in the best fit for your, your, uh, your, your gifts, your abilities, your talents. Or maybe because, not just a poor fit, because, but because you're trying to fit into every role in the church or in your job. You're trying to do everything. So either you're trying to meet the expectations of certain people or of everyone. And if you combine this with a lack of boundaries, eventually it's going to result in what's called overload. Uh, there's an excellent book called Margin, which came out uh, by a doctor many years ago, which attends to this issue. Uh, so the, uh, the pastor or someone in a particular job experiences this, will start to feel like they're just, ex they're just performing an external function but their heart's no longer in it. It doesn't match up with their internal design. So they start to lose joy and energy and uh, focus. So in this case, we will help the uh, pastor to write a mission statement to find out where's their best fit. 
What are your gifts, abilities, and talents that best fit with the, uh, the, the ministry that you have in front of you or with the job that you're performing? 80% uh, of pastors, according to those surveyed, uh, will not be in ministry 10 years from now, and only a fraction of pastors make it a lifelong career because of burnout. 91% um, say they've experienced burnout of some sort in the past. Uh, we had a pastor named Pastor Justin come a few years ago, and he could count nine hats that he was fulfilling in the church ministry, including uh, people responder, counselor, preacher, of course, businessman, personal manager, coach, teacher, strategic planner, trainer, visionary, administrator, uh, on uh, probably a few more that he didn't even realize. Okay, we are help, able to help him pull back to the three or four areas of ministry that were the best fit for him. Third is relational or family fatigue. These first, first two areas of fatigue can start to play out as a stress on one's family. And what happens is you no longer have the energy to connect with your family. Or you put yourself on some kind of spiritual pedestal and you can't come down from that just to form close friendships and allow people to see into your life, see inside your soul, see your areas of weakness, your sins. How many of you have an accountability partner where you can share your struggles and your sins? I'm raising my hand because I do. And if I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have that group of guys. If you don't have that, I would really highly recommend you find that because it's incredibly important for long, longevity in ministry or just in life. Um, so 80% of uh, ministry spouses said they felt left out of the ministry by their, their, uh, by their husband. Uh, they felt unappreciated by their church. 81% of pastors said they had insufficient time for their spouse. 72% of those surveyed feel like they don't have a good marriage. 72% of pastors. So it's a really rampant problem here. So what we do is we provide courses like VOCA, where we help people, and uh, again, these two uh, gentlemen went through that course. We help people to hear God's call again and write down a life plan based upon that calling, that unique calling for their life. And we believe you can hear God's unique and specific calling for your life, and you can refocus your entire life around that calling. I'd highly recommend, if, we, if, if possible, that we do this workshop with the entire church. Uh, let's look at the call of Moses. It's a great prototype uh, of a biblical call. And we see a similar pattern showing up with Abraham, Moses, the call of Isaiah, with Jesus' disciples, with Paul. Let's look, though, at Moses and see the pattern of God's call here. Starting out in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where you may be familiar with this story, where the first three verses talks about how there was a bush that was burning, but it didn't burn up. It's kind of like one of those tumbleweed bushes out in the desert. You'd expect it to burn in about two seconds. But this one doesn't burn up, burn up after several minutes or maybe an hour. So it shows God's eternality. It shows, God, shows God's power. Also, uh, God tells Moses, you're standing on holy ground. It shows God's holiness. This is the God that's about to speak to Moses. So in verse 4, God called out to Moses from within this bush. And that word call, the Hebrew karach, is the word of a summons. To stand before God. It's such a report to God and receive a special message just for him. So God's calling out from within the bush. Now, if somebody calls you from, from a bush, calls your name two times, you probably should stop and listen. And that's exactly what happens. And this is the vertical call, which comes in the next in the next, that same verse, latter part of verse 4. Moses, Moses, I will be with you. Notice he doesn't say to Moses, first of all, Moses, go rest with the people out of Egypt. No. The first primary call is Moses I will be with you. Now, a few verses later, this I explains that I, this is the I am. This is Yahweh speaking to him. The eternal one that he sees illustrated in the burning bush. 
And this eternal one will explain to Moses along the path of his, of his journey who he is with more detail. He's Yahweh, as we see in chapter 3, but then you'll see he's Yahweh Rapha, his healer. He's Yahweh Jireh, his provider. He's Yahweh Sabaoth. He's the God of rest. And several others, okay? He's uh, Yahweh Nissi, the Lord your victory. Dozens of these names that clarify further and further who this is. So, the primary vertical call, what we call purpose, is your first call. Is to know God, to know his character, and to experience. In fact, when the scriptures talk about knowing God, that's a word that means that we know him by experience. We just don't know him theologically, though it's important. But we know by experience God's character. And that's the primary call. Moses, Moses, actually, that repeating of his name shows this, this is the language of calling. This is a very intimate conversation. I will be with you. I will be present with you at all times. So the primary call is to know me and experience my presence. All right, now the secondary call is the horizontal call, which we also refer to as mission. And that's in verse 10. Now in verse 8, actually we read where, uh, where God says to, uh, says to Moses, Behold, I, am go I see the plight of my people suffering in Egypt. I will come down to them to bring them up. To, I will come down to rescue them from the, land, the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up to a good and spacious land, a, a land flowing with milk and honey. And I love that because that's a typical redemption verse. There's a lot of redemptive verses in Scripture. But this is redemption because it talks about how Yahweh will come down and then he will bring them up. And I, also, I always ask my students when they read that, what's the contrast? You know, what are the opposites? It's pretty basic, but down and up, okay? Redemptive language is God's going to bring them out of a place of trouble and rescue them and bring them to a place of safety. And that's redemption. That's what God does with us. He brings us out of a place of darkness and trouble and delivers us to the kingdom of his beloved son in a new life. Okay, but here's what Moses is going to do in verse 10. He's going to participate with Yahweh in that redemption. I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people out of Egypt. Now, if you went back to chapter 2 of Exodus, it will show you that Moses had been gifted by God and designed in such a way so that he could fulfill this mission. It, tell you, it, told you, it told you in chapter 2 that he was a good confronter. He confronted an Egyptian. Problem was, he uses that confrontation gift inappropriately and actually killed the Egyptian. Uh, also, you saw that he had compassion for the, uh, the, Midian, the women in Midian. He helped them when they were in, time, in a time of trouble. So he had all these character qualities that were going to be appropriate for his mission as he's being sent to go to the Pharaoh in Egypt and bring the people out of Egypt. That's his mission. He's designed to do this, and this is the task that aligns with that design. And then finally, there's actually a third call listed here, and that's the practical call, or vision. Uh, yeah, practical call. And so uh, that's in verse 12, where Yahweh says to him, and you will worship God on this mountain. Okay, he's standing on Mount Sinai. He's going to go into Egypt. He's going to, you know, be initiate the ten plagues, and God will show his power by confronting the Egyptians and confronting the Pharaoh with these ten plagues. Finally, the Pharaoh will allow the Egyptians to leave and then chases them down. But he tells Moses that you're going to, after you rescue the people out of Egypt, you're going to bring them all back. What, 100,000? 500,000? I don't know how many exactly. He's going to bring all that mass of people across the Red Sea and back down, I think it's uh, 500 miles or more, all the way back down, maybe it's 1,000 miles, all the way back down to Mount Sinai again. And you're going to worship God again on this mountain. That's an incredible vision. And then uh, God's going to reveal step by step how he will bring, how he will go into Egypt, how he will bring the people out, and it will reveal these, reveal these steps along the way. So he gives him a vision, and then he gives him practical steps to fulfill the vision. So that's the practical call. We see this pattern over and over throughout Scripture in every call narrative. All right, so I want to talk about some of the, uh, just 
two of the people we've had come to the Oasis that have benefited from this process of refining their calling. That first of all, the first one of the first two guys that came was Pastor Bill Johnson, a pastor from Ohio who was actually fired from his church for preaching the gospel. He came two weeks later. Everybody loved him in his church except for two elders who somehow got him fired. And the rest of the church loved him, and they sent him up to us. And we got to work with this incredible man, incredible passion for God and for the church. And uh, here's his testimony. Essentially, he was saying that finding his calling restored his life, restored his ministry, and restored his marriage. His wife did not have any clue on how to fit into his ministry. That was part of his weakness. He didn't know how to help her fit her gifts and abilities into the ministry. And then he found a church out in the Boston area that was an incredible fit for him. He's been there ever since. Um, another one is Mark and Jill Bird. They're from Ohio also. And they came last weekend. Okay, So I'm giving you the first one. Well, the first that came and then the last one. So we've had dozens, uh, probably about 60 in between in the past uh, eight years. But here's the mission statement that each of them wrote that helped them refocus their ministry, because they, Mark just became the director of this large ministry. It's called Revive Ohio, and he's the director of a revival ministry in Ohio, and Jill has a major part of it in that as well. And uh, so there's their mission statement that they wrote, and they developed a plan of action around those statements, uh, and then there's also the testimonies that they provide. I'll just give you a minute to, uh, to read that if you'd like, and I'll take a, take a step here. I was a uh, professor at Hillsdale College. Anybody heard of Hillsdale? Uh, okay. okay. So that's up in uh, Southern Michigan. And a uh, great conservative Christian college in Southern Michigan. I was there for 14 years. Now we're going full time with the Oasis. We are governed by a ministry board and also by a larger ministry in Florida, BMI USA. They send missionaries around the world. But we also have eight board of directors that help us with our planning and financial support and, uh, and advice, etc. We're also connected with Life Impact Ministries that, do, that helps people start Oases. We're the Oasis branch of Bridge, of Bridge Ministries. And here are the little uh, Oases around the world. They actually have about 30 of these around the world. And their, their mission is to impact all nations for Christ by strengthening the vitality of ministry leaders through hosted places of skilled, personalized care. And so um, there's four ministries we have to extend our ministry, four projects that we have to extend our ministry further. I'll just touch on each. The first, I mentioned earlier, we provide renewal courses for pastors and for others. The first one's the VOCA course, VOCA workshop. Second one, Renewal in the Holy Spirit, a practical and biblical theology of the Holy Spirit. Actually, I was privileged to be able to write a book on the topic of the Holy Spirit. It's only 300 some pages. Uh, but uh, it was kind of a uh, life-changing project for myself. And so we teach out of that book. Third, Be My Witnesses. I taught this in my own church a couple months ago where we help people develop a Christian worldview, a Christian mindset and discern other worldviews. We help them share the gospel and learn basic apologetics, basic ways to defend the faith. And then thirdly, we help them to develop the mind of Christ. And then finally, we have a course in biblical theme, just learning the basic major themes of scripture. Uh, so we can solidify your knowledge and your trust in God's character, but also understand the themes of creation, covenants, redemption, humanity and sin, the kingdom of God, Christ, etc. Second major project is the Africa Project. I have recently been accepted to teach with a seminary in the Kalamazoo area, and they actually have, are starting seminaries in Africa. So uh, one is in Nigeria, one in Uganda, and so uh, I've got the privilege of teaching several courses, the same four courses uh, in Africa, 
mostly remote courses, but also we'll be able to go live and teach once every year or two. And there's one of our representatives in Africa, Martin. The third project is uh, the Holy Spirit Project. I have a friend that actually wants me to rewrite this book for a popular audience. Uh, so I'm going to be starting on that in January. And uh, he's helping to sponsor that. And then finally, uh, Michael here knows my wife. He graduated from high school with Julie. She is starting a podcast this fall. I'm going to be helping her with that. So uh, she is a big name in the Southern Gospel world. So uh, she's very connected with Southern Gospel quartets. So, uh, okay, finally, our vision for ministry from today, for the next three years or more, it, we, we, uh, we believe this comes from 1 Kings chapter 17. Let me just read that for you. You may be familiar. Now Elijah said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be no dew or rain in the next few years except at my word. Here's a prophet who's confronting King Ahab, the king of Israel, who's actually an evil king, confronting him and calling for a drought. Verse 2, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Now that notion of the word, the Hebrew is davar. The davar coming to him, the word of the Lord coming to him, that's the language of calling. He's about to receive his unique calling as a prophet. And verse 3 tells, tells us, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. So God's going to hide him for a while, We're kind of like our oasis, where you can sit and meditate on God's word and to learn and discern his calling. And while he's there, verse 4, you will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Now, I'm looking at this. Actually, let me go on. So he did as the Lord uh, told him in verse 6, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. Okay, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, that's probably not raven food that, that Elijah is eating. You know, the ravens are somehow miraculously able to bring choice bread and meat to Elijah. You know, great people food. And so uh, God provides for him good food, good nourishment, and that's how we see ourselves. Provide the oasis, but also providing choice nourishment for pastors and others that come to our oasis. How does this apply to us? We, um, we believe, believe that God is actually calling 60 ravens, primary partners, uh, to partner up with our ministry. We love to partner with some churches. And if your church believes or feels led to be a raven, basically, as we meet the needs of pastors, we're looking for a few churches to meet our needs uh, for our support. So we wonder if you prayerfully consider being one of those ravens, and we'll leave that up to you. So I want to dive now into Acts chapter 1, 1 to 3. Now I called this section the Holy Spirit, the Kingdom of God, but I also could have called it the Holy Spirit and your calling life. How is it the Holy Spirit, receiving the Spirit of God, helps you live your calling like Moses discovered his calling in the wilderness at the burning bush, how is it the Holy Spirit can help you clarify your call? So I want to look at Acts chapter 1 to discover this. Okay? Some really excellent material here. So, how am I doing on time? Uh, Just fine. I'm sorry? Got, what, half hour? Sure. Okay. Um, great. So, let's see. Uh, Acts 1, 1 through 3. Let's read that. And, and I want to look at the two major themes that show up in this passage. Because I really like examining biblical themes. And the two major themes are the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of God. And a lot of times when people read this well-known chapter, they don't see these two themes intersecting and why that's so important. Okay? So, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So, basically, this is Luke. Right, the book of Acts, connecting this book back to the book, the Gospel of Luke. Okay, so he's talking about, he wrote that book to describe what Jesus did in his ministry. Okay, verse 2. Until the day he, Jesus, was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So, Jesus 
taught and preached and ministered through the power of the Holy Spirit in Luke's Gospel. In fact, Luke's Gospel emphasizes the Holy Spirit's role in Jesus' ministry more than any other Gospel. That Jesus was led along the path of his ministry, each step along the way, by the Holy Spirit from his conception all the way through his crucifixion. So dozens of places you see this, so that you can essentially walk that path with Jesus. You can understand that you can be empowered by the Spirit as well. Now we come to, come to Acts, and the Holy Spirit takes center stage again. But here we see now, it talks about in verse 2, how Jesus is giving instructions to the whole, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles after his crucifixion and resurrection. All the way up to the point where he's taken up into heaven. So you know Jesus' ministry, he has his ministry on earth, then he's crucified, then his resurrection, and then he has those 40 days between the resurrection and his ascension. That's where we are right now. He's giving some teaching, and it tells us that this teaching, through Jesus, even though he's got resurrection power now, he's still teaching through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's teaching the apostles that he had chosen. Okay, the apostles are obviously the ones that are going to inaugurate the present form of the kingdom of God on earth, so the Holy Spirit is doing this through Jesus. Verse 3, though, is critical. After his suffering, he presented himself to them, to the, to the apostles, and gave them convincing proof, proof that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Okay, so here you see. These two themes are aligned. He's speaking through, Jesus is speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's speaking about the kingdom of God. Okay, this chapter will continue to show these two themes uh, connected as we go forward. That's verses 4 and 5. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them the command, do not leave Jerusalem, they're currently in Jerusalem, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. Now, what's that gift? They knew what the gift was. The gift in the Old Testament is Joel chapter 2. Now look in there, if you have your Bible, look in Joel chapter 2, and it tells you what the gift is. This is the gift that talks about how the Holy Spirit will come to bring forth the future kingdom. So, Joel 2... Joel chapter 2, verses um, 28 through 32. Uh, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days, and everyone who calls in the Lord, name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 32. From Mount Zion and in Jerusalem will be deliverance, uh, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors, as the Lord calls. This is language of the day of the Lord, which refers to the coming kingdom. It's the inauguration of the kingdom of God on earth. And before that happens, there's going to be these signs. The Holy Spirit will be poured out, and there'll be signs associated with that, including dreaming dreams, prophecy, seeing visions, all are signs of the coming kingdom. This is the gift that the Father promised, and this is the gift of Joel chapter 2 that all of the Jews anticipated. And it will be a sign of the coming kingdom. And then he goes on, this famous verse 5, For John baptized in water, but in a few days he will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay, now this is the assembly of God church. They talk a lot about the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let's clarify a little bit further what's going on in this verse. Okay, so, uh, what, and there's a connection here with this notion of baptism with the kingdom of God. It's, you see this initially back in Matthew chapter 3. It tells us there's a parallel here. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of, of, uh, of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, John the Baptist is preaching a a, a, uh, a message of repentance. Why? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is right here in your midst, about to be inaugurated. And it goes on in verse 11. 
I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay? There's kind of a comparison here between John who baptizes in water a kingdom baptism to prepare people through repentance, to prepare people for the kingdom of God, which is at hand, and then Jesus who will baptize in the Holy Spirit, which will bring the kingdom of God into you. Okay? So that future kingdom of God, which they all thought of as a future event, is now coming to you. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now remember Moses. Moses for Moses, the, uh, the burning bush, well that was, a, that was fire. That symbolized the Holy Spirit, but that fire was external to him. And it spoke to him externally. Now, the Holy Spirit, who is associated with fire, will be in you. That fire references burning as in purification, but also life, and also expansion, and several other things. Um, to clarify further, though, look at uh, who is John the Baptist. In a, very interesting. In uh, Matthew 11, verse 11, it clarifies, Jesus tells us who John the Baptist is when they ask him. He says, truly, I tell you, among these among those born of women, there has not been anyone greater than John the Baptist. Really? Of all people ever born up to this point, John the Baptist is the greatest person to be ever born of women? Excluding Jesus himself. He's the greatest human being in the Old Covenant period. But... He goes on and says, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven, those who receive the kingdom are actually greater than he. That's referring to the new covenant. Very interesting. Okay, so this comparison, you go back then to this verse 5. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let me catch up to where I was ahead. Let me come comment on that. Um, yeah, uh, basically saying that the Holy Spirit is now executing the kingdom of God in human lives. And everything associated with the Holy Spirit, whether it be gifts, or fruit of the Spirit, or uh, the new life that He provides, these are all kingdom, all associated with the kingdom. The kingdom of God is the umbrella term, and all these are associated with the kingdom of God. Essentially, the future kingdom of God is coming into the present. Now, you remember those movies, Back to the Future? Did you like those? That was where they, they went back to the future. Well, this is the future coming back to the present. The future kingdom is in your soul, in your life, in your church now. All right. Finally, verse, our next verses 6 and 7. Well, when they hear this about the gift about to be poured out from Joel chapter 2, they gathered around Jesus and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And so they hear this announcement of Joel chapter 2. Immediately, they think that Jesus is going to militarily take over Jerusalem. Now, the hinge concept here goes back to the Jewish expectations of the kingdom. They expected that a Messiah would come, a human king, endowed with special gifts and powers. He would live in concealment and then he would come forth and showing himself to be the Messiah with signs and wonders, kind of like what Jesus did. But he would be empowered by God in order to destroy God's enemies and Israel's enemies through military conquest. And as a result, Jerusalem would be renovated, the new Jerusalem would appear, and the Messiah would reign over the earth. The, uh, the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, David's descendant, would rule over the earth eternally. Well, this goes actually back to an extra biblical text that the Jews all hinge this around called the Apocalypse of Baruch. It's not in scripture, but the Jews loved it. It talks about a heavenly Jerusalem that was originally in paradise with Adam before Adam sinned. When Adam sinned, if this paradise was taken away from him and was taken up into heaven and preserved there. So this new, it was being preserved, expanded, and prepared. This new Jerusalem would eventually come down and appear on earth when the Messiah came. And the Messiah 
would take over in this, Jerusalem, this new Jerusalem and scatter all of his enemies. No wonder they, would, they loved the prayer from Jesus, the Lord's Prayer, may your kingdom come. They just, assert, they just interpreted it militarily oftentimes. So, but in their mind, all war would now cease, all striving would cease, and righteousness and peace would prevail on the earth. The curse of Genesis 3 would be broken. So this is going to be a fulfillment of those prophecies. Correct? Well, look at verse 7. Jesus said to them, no, he kind of gently rebukes him here, not for the desire of the kingdom, but for the timing. It's not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority. So, the fullness of the political and, and, and military kingdom is not to be fulfilled right yet. Okay? But what's going to happen instead? Verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. You, but instead, instead of the fullness of the political kingdom coming, you will receive the kingdom spiritually. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to their most parts of the earth. Let's break these two verses down a little further. Acts 1, 8. First of all, you shall. Okay, the word you is referring not just to the disciples, but we see in chapter 2 of Acts, it's going to refer to all peoples of all cultures. In fact, that miracle of people hearing the gospel in their own tongues, the miracle, the gift of tongues, and they hear the, hear the gospel in their own languages, that affirms all cultures as places where the gospel can now be received. All races, all people are now to be incorporated in the kingdom of God. So you includes everyone. Previously, it was just the Jews that could experience the fullness of the Spirit, uh, or just kings or prophets or judges in the Old Testament. But now everyone can receive the Spirit. And it says, you shall, which is not that you must. It's not a command, but you shall receive. This is a promise. This is the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. And so this is a gift. And it says, you shall receive power. The word receive there is the Greek lambano, which is to take up a thing to be carried. Okay? You take something up, you pick it up, and you carry it along with you. It's not, it's not you. Just like if you had a precious jewel, you picked it up and carried it along with you. It's not you, but it's a precious jewel that you would protect as you took with you. And that's essentially the idea of lambano, the Holy Spirit. You take it up. It lives within you. And you protect it. Uh, and so then you receive power. The word power, the, the Greek, is dunamis. You may have heard this word. That's sort of the root word of dynamite. What sort of power is this? Is it a physical power? Is it some kind of personal ability? Well, during Jesus' ministry, dunamis was often seen in terms of healings, and miracles, but the point of the dunamis in Jesus' ministry was to point people to the gospel, to the good news of salvation, the good news of the coming kingdom. Okay, so these miracles were not ends in themselves. They showed forth God's power and glory, but they weren't the most important thing. They weren't the true dunamis. You know, healings are awesome, but we're all going to die someday. They're just temporary. Dunamis, for Paul, as he clarifies further what it is in his letters, is, is associated with the gospel. Great verse is Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for, it is, for the gospel is the power of God, the dunamis of God for salvation, for the Jew and also for the Greek. So, now this is a power of the Holy Spirit that resides within us. I love the songs that we worship with early on. One of the first couple of songs talked about how Yahweh, the, 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 uh, the eternal Yahweh, resides within. That's the idea here. Is God who is external to us in the Old Testament. He was with us, but external to us. Now he's in us. And so this is the power of the Spirit showing forth God's glory in and through our lives. Okay? But Acts 1.8 is really about calling. Because this Holy Spirit will come upon us. Why? To help us fulfill our call. What the Holy Spirit does in human lives is he brings, he brings the power source. He brings our lives to its fruition 
as to what it was intended to be. So, the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit anyway? We talk about the Holy Spirit a lot, I'm sure, in this church. And that's great. I love the Holy Spirit. But who is the Holy Spirit? You know, a lot of Christians are confused about the Holy Spirit. 80, or, I'm sorry, 58% of Christians have an unbiblical view of the Holy Spirit. In a survey, they answered that it's a symbol of God's power, or it's a force, you know, kind of like Star Wars, but not a living divine person. I mean, we're talking about the Trinity here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three divine persons in one God. That's the way we believe from Scripture. But 58% of Christians don't didn't answer that way. They thought of the Holy Spirit just as a force. Kind of like in Star Wars. That's pretty impersonal. No. The Holy Spirit is the glory of God who wants to take up residence in us, empower our lives, and show His glory through us. So He's a divine person, and He it's kind of like, um, okay, so I've got this cup here. Okay, let's say I um, let's say I want to get the air out of the cup. Right? How do I do it? Well, I can put the lid on here, and I can try to suck out all the air, right? I mean, that's not, I could put it in a vac, kind of some kind of vacuum, and that's a lot of work. A lot easier just to fill the cup with water. That will remove all the air. Okay, same thing with our lives. We're like a cup. Okay. But we're like the most expensive, expensive, glorious cup ever, ever uh, designed. In fact, here is the world's most expensive glass. It's worth $400,000. It's adorned with 15 carats of white diamonds and 6 carats of rare I got Argyle pink diamonds. $400,000 cup. Okay? But you know what? It's beautiful, but it has no function unless you fill it. It doesn't perform its function unless you fill it uh, and use it with, uh, for its purpose. Same with us. Uh, we are God's glorious temples created in His image, and yet we are not fulfilling our purpose unless we are filled with the Spirit. And so, um, uh, let's see, where was I here? Uh, so, yeah, it brings us to, uh, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, etc. My witnesses there's three uses of witness in Scripture. Number one is the historical sense. You witnessed an event in the past. You were a spectator to a past event. And this is true of us as believers. Okay? We, of course, the disciples were witnesses of the past events of Christ. But we, too, are witnesses as we read the Scriptures. And we read about those events. But there were also witnesses of the kind of change he makes in our lives. And these are what we can report to others. So a witness is, number one, someone who sees what happened historically, but number two, they report that to others. Okay? And so um, the second form of witness, though, is the legal sense. You could be called, if you saw an event, you could be called in a courtroom to testify about what happened in a legal sense. And so we, too, are legal witnesses as well, because a lot of legal language is used regarding our status. We've been justified as if we stood before God with the sentence of guilt and we've been justified by Christ. And now we show forth that justification to the world that we are not guilty. Third form of witness is an ethical sense. Those who follow Christ's example and so by the power of the Spirit they show forth through the strength and the genuineness of their faith the Holy Spirit lives that faith through them, and they show the glory of Christ's example through their own life. So that's what a witness is. And then, so that's that's actually our call. All right, now we talked about the primary call to know God. Our secondary call is in this world. Just like Moses had been given a unique call to go rescue the people from Egypt, our unique call is to be his witnesses. But each of us is designed uniquely in order to be that kind of witness. We have to determine what kind of witness we are. In what sense are we designed to show, to, to be a witness in this world, to testify of what we have seen? Well, it actually tells us the different types of witnesses that there could be in this world in verse 8, in the latter part. In Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and for the most parts of the earth. So some people are a witness in a local sense. 
perhaps in, perhaps in your no, own neighborhood or your own city. Now, my wife, Julie, uh, before I met her, she believed God was calling her to walk around downtown Battle Creek and to pray for the city, to pray for revival, to pray that she would have some kind of opportunity. She was a radio DJ at a very small station that probably went out to about 100 people at the time. But she would walk around the city and pray for revival in Battle Creek and pray that she'd be able to somehow be a witness to all the city and maybe even broader than that. Well, she ended up losing her job because the station went under and uh, nothing came of it for a while. Five years later, though, she was, uh, she was invited to come be a, re re a DJ on the lar one of the largest stations probably in all of Southwest Michigan maybe even in Michigan. You can get the station, it, it comes all the way down at this point. She can now reach hundreds of thousands of people throughout Battle Creek and beyond with the, uh, the gospel. And she's on there, uh, she just finished up, she's on there every Sunday morning uh, doing a, her hymn time show. So, uh, but that was a result of her, her witness, <clears throat> in a local witness. Next you see Judea and Samaria. So that could be a regional witness. Judea was like the broader state, and then Samaria was the state up north. Actually, the Samaritans, you know, didn't have association racially with the Judeans, with the Jews. So number one, you could be a witness in Judea, your own region. I have a friend named Andy who's a truck driver. He drives to Frankfurt and picks up things. He drives to Chicago. He's kind of a regional truck driver. He has a witness everywhere he goes, okay? He talks about Christ every place he goes. So uh, that's like a regional witness. And then the Samaria, well, that could be somebody who goes across culture, a cross-cultural witness to people that God has revealed to you that you can have the capacity to reach people of other cultures. And finally, to the remotest parts of the earth. Some people may be given the, uh, the capacity or the leading to go into other cultures through your job or as a missionary. So how do you... How do you uh, uh, discover and fulfill your, I refer to this as your practical call. Just like Moses was given a vision to go and rescue the people out of Egypt and bring them back to Mount Sinai, God wants to give you a vision for a specific place where he has designed you to have an impact. Uh, locally, in your region, or perhaps uh, cross-culturally around the world. So how do you discern that? First of all, Ask God, where is it you call me? Where is my passion? What kind of people, what kind of place have you, do you want to lay in my heart? Ask him to put a burden on your heart for specific people or a specific place. And then secondly, help, ask him to help you clarify your abilities and gifts and talents and passions that could be activated in that specific place. Because you are being, have been given a unique set, a unique mix of abilities to reach people that no one else can reach. So uh, as you put those two places two together, a specific place, and then you, your unique abilities, and you bring those together, you can have a unique ministry. So uh, I like to finish with prayer and ask God to do just that very thing. To ask God to reveal to us the place, but also our abilities to reach people in that specific place. Okay? And then uh, we'll close. So, all right. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bring, I thank you for your Holy Spirit, first of all, that gift that fulfills us. And when doing so, you allow us to realize our full humanity, to live our true humanity. Our minds can be activated, can, can think clearly. Our hearts can feel as it should. We, our emotions are restored. We can experience the fruit of the Spirit. Our actions can align with the gifts that you've given us. We can live out specific actions based upon those gifts. Our will can align with your will. But Lord, in, in light of that, I ask you would lay upon each of us where you have called us to go in order to have an impact for Christ, in order to fulfill our practical call. And then secondly, Lord, I pray you clarify for each of us our abilities and gifts and talents and passions that you would have us utilize in that specific place you're calling us to go to. Lord, lay these burdens upon us. 
in the days ahead. Help us to take the time to hear your voice, perhaps write down some notes, perhaps doing some journaling on the place that you'd have us to go. Maybe it's locally, perhaps region, or even internationally. And then the specific abilities that we can employ in that place. We pray this for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.